Well, good morning and welcome to March Grand Rounds. Dr. Chansky asked me to moderate this morning's um, session. I'm Lisa Tatesman. I'm one of the orthopedic trauma surgeons at Harborview for those I don't know. And it is uh, truly my privilege to introduce the topic and the speakers this morning. Our speakers for today are going to be Dr. Avery Novak, one of our outstanding fourth year residents, two of my trauma colleagues from Harborview, Dr. David Barre, our fellowship director, and Dr. Michael Giffins. And with that, we will turn it over to Avery. And just as a note, as usual, please feel free to use the, um, when we have the discussion, we'll open it up and you can use the uh, chat function or um, raise your hand or unmute yourself and we'll leave time at the end for questions. So with that, Avery, please take it away. Thanks, Dr. Chaitzman. So we're going to be talking today about proximal femoral non-union, specifically pertrochanteric and intertrochanteric fractures, both non-union management, but also focusing on how we avoid getting there in the first place, making sure that we manage them appropriately at the index surgery. I have no disclosures to report. Those for Dr. Bray and Dr. Githens are listed below. So for an overview to begin, I'll review some background information, relevant anatomy and considerations for fixation at the index surgery. Then we'll talk more about non-unions and Dr. Bray will speak more in depth about how he approaches management of these. And following that, Dr. Giffins will discuss some of our research detailing our experience at Harborview treating for trope non-unions and circle back to again, give us techniques for managing these appropriately the first time around. We felt that this was relevant because proximal femur fractures are common injuries that we manage. Incidents worldwide is estimated about 1.6 million hip fractures annually, and in 2010, there were nearly 260,000 hospital admissions for hip fractures among people aged 65 and older in the U.S. Intertrochanteric fractures make up nearly half of these, in one study approximately 42%. About three-quarters of these patients were women. The majority of these injuries are low-energy mechanisms and occurring in patients over the age of 50. And while there's a multitude of research looking at mortality rates, which can approach 30% in one year, there's little written on non-union rates. In some instances, there are some series estimating around 1% to 2%. However, given the frequency of these fractures, it's not an insignificant number, and there's very little written to guide us on management strategies for these failures when they do present. We'll first briefly review the native anatomy of this region. The inner truck region is extracapsular, extending from the distal extent of the BZ cervical neck to the proximal subtrochanteric region. The neck shaft angle is on average 120 to 135 degrees, with approximately 10 to 15 degrees of anaversion of the neck relative to the condyles. And the typical deformity of fractures in this region is external rotation, abduction, and flexion of the proximal segment. The glute medius and minimus and TFL abduct the proximal fragment and insertion of the short external rotators on the greater trochanter also serve to actually rotate it. Flexion of the proximal segment of the femur is primarily driven by the iliopsoas inserting on the lesser trochanter if it's intact with lesser contributions also from the pectineus, sartorius and rectus. The adductors including the longus, brevis and magnus as well as the gracilis and pectineus are originally on the ischial or pubic rami and the insert on the proximal femoral diaphysis distal to the fracture and accentuate the varus deformity and shortening that we typically see. This area in general is very well vascularized given the robust muscular attachments and there's rich collateral circulation with contributions from the ascending branches of MFCA, LFCA, as well as the superior and inferior gluteal arteries. However, this region is subject to very strong mechanical forces acting over short bony segments with large compressive loads described medially and tensile forces laterally. We'll propose that the trabecular bone in the proximal femur responds to external mechanical loading stimuli and orient to align with the principal stress trajectories. The primary compressive trabeculae are vertically oriented extending from the cortex of the femoral head into the neck with secondary trabeculae crossing from the greater to the lesser trochanter. And these could give rise to the dense calcar bone which provides support to the proximal femur when it's intact. The primary tensile arc extends from the lateral margin of the greater trochanter medially to the inferior femoral head, nearly perpendicular to the axis of the diaphysis. There's a variety of different classification schema that have been used to describe fractures in this region. However, fundamentally, they typically seek to differentiate between stable fractures, which are those that will resist medial compressive loads once reduced, versus unstable fractures, which will collapse into varus, or the shaft will displace medially. In 1949, Evans published a classification system based on the direction of the fracture line and the ability to obtain and maintain a reduction with skeletal traction, describing type 1 standard obliquity fractures, including unstable and stable patterns, and type 2 reverse obliquity patterns. 
Other modifications of this classification and different schemas followed, and later on, the more commonly referenced AOOTA classification was developed. In this classification, type 31A fractures, which are fractures involving the trochanteric area of the proximal femur, are divided into three main subgroups. A1 fractures are simple two-part fractures. A2 are multi-fragmentary, with the fracture line beginning anywhere on the greater trochanter and extending medially in two or more places. These are generally considered unstable with the exception of the first subgroup with an isolated lesser fragment. And then we have group A3 fractures in which the lateral fracture line is located beneath the vastus ridge. These include the reverse obliquity fractures and again are generally considered unstable. It's worth noting that this classification was also so further revised in 2018 in the AOOTA fracture compendium with lateral wall thickness used as a corollary for stability, which we'll talk more about shortly. And in this schema, A1 fractures are simple fractures with an intact lateral wall, so a thickness of greater than 20.5 millimeters, and A2 are multifragmentary fractures with an incompetent lateral wall. So when we're determining fracture pattern radiographically, obviously we always want orthogonal imaging of the extremity. On the AP, we're looking at the integrity of the lateral cortex, looking for comminution and the obliquity of the fracture line. An attraction radiograph seen on the right is performed with gentle longitudinal traction and internal rotation of the injured leg and can allow us to better delineate the fracture morphology that's present and in some studies leads to more accurate fracture classification. And while much of what we're seeing is on the scene on the AP, a cross table lateral doesn't require us to manipulate the injured extremity and also helps to assess for posterior cortex combination. An AP pelvis allows us to evaluate the next shaft angle on the contralateral side for comparison. And then we also always need to ensure we have imaging of the entirety of the femur assessing for any pathologic fracture, bony deformities, or other implants that may be present that affect our implant selection for fixation. And then as we approach fracture fixation, again, the biologic environment of the proximal femur is often favorable, but there are several variables described by Coffrey that affect the mechanical effectiveness of fixation in this region. These include bone quality, fragment geometry, reduction, implant selection, and implant placement. And while bone quality and fracture geometry are patient dependent factors, the others are typically within the surgeon's control. With regards to fracture geometry, the obliquity of the main fracture line and the lateral wall integrity are especially important, which we'll talk more about. But we should also be looking for posterior medial comminution. As losing cortical contact in this area, we lose the main buttress to resist various bending moments, and also noting if the fracture extends distally into the subtrochanteric region. The obliquity of the fracture line is especially important as it pertains to implant selection. The diagram on the left is of a standard obliquity fracture extending from the greater to the lesser trochanter with the sliding hip screw and side plate device. And since the fracture plane is perpendicular to the screws, the patient weight bears this will allow controlled compression. In this paper published in JBJS in 2001, it looked at a key series of reverse obliquity fractures where the fracture plane is instead distal on the lateral cortex. And in this study, 5% of all inner trochs were reverse obliquity, and they found a high rate of failure with this pattern, with 32% going on to non-union or screw cutout. Much of this was related to implant selection as the highest rate of failure in the study was observed with sliding hip screw devices, which logically makes sense when you look at the figure on the right, as there's no lateral buttress. So as that fracture slides, you can't prevent the shaft from medializing given the obliquity of the fracture. Another particularly important part of fracture morphology is lateral wall integrity. In a study published by Palm and JBJS in 2007, it looked at a cohort of patients treated with sliding hip screw to assess integrity of the lateral wall and its effect on stability. The major takeaways from this study were that there's a significantly higher revision rate of 22% versus 3% for those with a fractured versus intact lateral wall, noted on the initial post-op films. This again makes sense because loss of that lateral buttress essentially allows it to behave similarly to reverse obliquity with uncontrolled collapse of the proximal fragment. Interestingly though, in this study, only 26% of those lateral wall fractures were present on preoperative radiographs, and in a majority of cases, they occurred intraoperatively. Given that incompetence of that structure has important implications for implant selection, in 2013, Shu published a paper looking at how thickness of the lateral fall may affect fracture risk occurring intraoperatively. They define lateral wall thickness as the distance in millimeters from a reference point three centimeters below the innominate tubercle of the greater trochanter, angled 135 degrees upward towards the fracture line on the AP radiograph. Somewhat intuitively, they found a higher rate of fracture with the lateral wall in A2 multifragmentary fractures compared to A1 two-part fractures. And the average lateral wall thickness was significantly different in those that sustained a lateral wall fracture versus those that did not. 
They were able to use ROC curve that estimated a threshold value that could predict lateral wall fracture of 20.5 millimeters, which is now utilized in the 2018 AOOTA classification schema for these. So as we've been talking about fracture geometry, obviously that partially dictates implant selection and those unstable patterns with an incompetent lateral cortex or reverse obliquity type, a sliding hip screw is not an appropriate device. Whereas if we use a cephalic medullary nail to manage those, the intramedullary component essentially acts as a lateral buttress to limit the amount of collapse that can occur. But for stable patterns, a sliding hip screw is still a very viable option, but you could also manage it with a short or a long nail or less commonly utilize a blade plate. And studies looking at sliding hip screw devices versus intramedullary nails have shown differences in blood loss, operative time, fluoroscopy, and cost, as nails are typically more expensive. But randomized control trials haven't determined any notable difference in clinical or functional outcomes between the two. Despite the lack of outcomes-driven data, the reality is that sliding hip screws are being used less frequently, and intramedullary nails are now most commonly used to treat these fractures. In one study looking at trends from 2007 to 2017 of ABOS board examinees, you can see that as of 2017, 92% of inner tropes are being fixed with an intramedullary nail. But regardless of which implant you're using, you need to ensure that you're using it appropriately and that the placement of the implant is appropriate. The Baumgartner paper is frequently cited describing the tip apex distance, which is measured as the sum of the distance in millimeters from the tip of the lag screw to the apex of the femoral head on the AP and lateral radiograph. This was described as an important predictor of lag screw cutout in which collapse of the neck shaft angle into varus leads to cutout of the screw from the femoral head. In that study, the average tip apex distance was 38 millimeters in those with screw cutout and 24 millimeters in those without and established for us a goal of less than 25 millimeters. Given this measure is based on utilization of a hip screw and inch measuring nails are now more frequently used, more recent studies have also demonstrated that this measurement can be used with the cephalomedullary device. In this study by Teller in 2009, the average tip apex distance of patients with a cephalometry nail fixation who did not have cutout was 18 millimeters compared to 38 millimeters for those who did. And using a cutoff of 25 millimeters, there was a statistically significant difference in the incidence of black screw cutout. More recently, though, a biomechanical study published in JOT looked at the position of the lag screw in a cephalomedullary nail in the femoral neck, and they suggested that inferior placement of the lag screw just above the calcar on the AP radiograph and central placement on the lateral radiograph was optimal biomechanically. They found that lag screw placement inferiorly in the AP plane maximized biomechanical stiffness, whereas placement centrally in the lateral plane maximized load to failure. And based on this, they described a calcar reference tip apex distance for a cephalomedrary device rather than using the center of the femoral head on the AP radiograph as described by Bumgarner. This was further supported by a 2014 study by Kashgar with a cohort of 77 patients. In that study, they noted a 13% rate of screw cutout, and they found that the Calgar reference tip apex distance was the only statistically significant factor in multivariate analysis. So when a patient does present with a non-union or failure of their construct, we need to consider a broad range of factors, both patient dependent and independent. If there's a fracture that got a good operation that should have healed and it didn't heal, we can't overlook metabolic or endocrine issues that may also be contributing. And there may be medical comorbidities or nutritional deficiencies that can and should be optimized prior to managing the non-union. Obviously assessing for nicotine use, as we know this is a risk factor for non-union and working towards cessation is important. And the vascularity of the environment is typically quite good. So assessing the mechanical environment factors, looking at fracture reduction, the fracture pattern, implant selection, and placement of that implant that may have contributed are critical. For patients with non-union, screening labs for those more common metabolic and endocrine contributors should typically be obtained. And then we should also always have a, maintain a suspicion for septic non-union. But once we've identified a non-union in this region and optimized any modifiable factors, then how do we manage it? If you look, you'll see that there's really an absence of literature to guide management of pertrochanteric non-unions and options can be far ranging, including cephalomedrally devices, blade plates, or combinations of implants, or even arthroplasty. There may be a need for corrective osteotomies and structural biologic bone graft. And when approaching management of these, there can be many challenges and different goals that you're simultaneously trying to achieve. Oftentimes, one of the first challenges is removing prior hardware, which may be broken and result in bony defects. And you also need to understand deformities that may be present and have a strategy to correct it, as trying to restore the normal biomechanical forces is likely to give us our best chances of achieving union. 
We want to try and load the non-union and provide compression to confer stability when able to do so and optimize the biomechanical environment by neutralizing non-compressive bending, shear, and torsional forces. Trying to achieve this requires a patient-specific approach both based on radiographs, but also importantly, the patient's physiologic and functional status. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bray to talk more about his treatment strategy for these non-unions and how to address many of these challenges. I hope everyone can see that. Um, my name is David Bray, uh, and I'm uh, appreciative to both Avery and Michael for uh, including me in this um, uh, grand rounds today. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to have the part where there's very little in the way of any literature. So that's uh, pretty good for me. Um, hopefully by the end of this talk, and I'm going to try to rock through this talk pretty quickly, uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit about failure peculiarities. And I think as uh, Avery's alluded to, why restoring alignment and good mechanics is really important. Some of the things that I've learned and to do that, I think it's best for me to just show some case examples. There's no question that the last 25 years, we've had this huge shift <clears throat> of, uh, of implant placement, as Avery's alluded to, to treat these particular fracture patterns, right? So. So as we know, the DHS or the sliding hip screw um, was ubiquitous for treating uh, all these fractures, certainly in my residency. <clears throat> and of course, their failures were very uh, predictable because they were used for unstable fracture patterns that she's already described. And so screw plate devices are still being used currently, uh, uh, but substantially less, and they will still present with unique disengagements or, or surgical technique errors, I think. And thankfully we have uh, cephalomedullary implants to help salvage some of those uh, particular uh, problems. But nails aren't the cure-all. Nothing is. We all have uh, pros and cons and failures with all these things. And, and I think one of the things that I get out of all this uh, uh, information is that uh, post-operative varus, post-operative lack of medial cortical support, and autodynamization, even with nails, are risk factors for non-union, at least in subtrochanteric uh, injury patterns. And even if you do a really good job and don't have any of those things associated, you still can have a non-union rate of almost 3%, uh, even when everything goes well. But unlike the DHS or the sliding hip screw type uh, implant, this is the failure mode that we commonly see now, right? You're going to see some sort of cephalomedullary device that's broken in the proximal portion, and invariably they're embarrassed, invariably they have some degree of flexion. Most often, Often their implant is a cephalomedullary nail or what we call a geriatric type nail with a very big proximal component and a single or dual um, cephalad portion that goes into the head. Most often it's broken that large portion where the large screw goes through it. And they may or may not have had a good start point and entrance trajectory into that proximal femur. They may or may not have had good proximal locking location. They may or may not have had a good reduction. As Avery alluded to, this is a, a vascularized area typically, and so they'll have some amount of callus and their non-unions typically remain quite vascularized. And in my experience, they're most often a bit older of a patient, they can be a bit more medically involved. And while those latter two things really aren't under our control so much, these former two, like their alignment and their implant management really falls under our um, uh, treatment strategy. I think in general, non-unions are a mechanical problem unless there's, <clears throat> excuse me, significant bone defect. Uh, and so optimizing the biomechanical environment, I think is critical. And, and biological, biological strategies are occasionally needed. And sometimes it's a little bit fashionable with certain kinds of products that are available, but appropriate mechanics is always needed. And, and the goal there is to create non-union stability. And around the proximal femur, it's no different. Restoring alignment and getting some sort of load through the non-union is ideal. <clears throat> so the general strategy for proximal femoral non-unions, you know, is, is to remove the implant. And I think that the complexity and time taken to do this should not be minimized, full stop. Uh, you have to have some strategy to restore the alignment. You have to have some consideration for, for the need for either structural or union type bone grafts and then to load the non-union when able. And I think the thing that drives me most with this is the restoration of alignment and that's why I still use this angled blade plate, you know, which has been around for a long, 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 long time. Um, but to me, uh, it's a very useful device uh, to, to do that. And like I said, the ability to, to achieve a definitive alignment with it is really what drives my uh, utilization of this. What have I learned about the angled blade plate? Well, I think the articulated tensioning device and the angled blade plate com combination is a real powerful way to correct alignment and to compress a non-union. I think you can restore significant malalignments without taking down the non-union by simply manipulating the head or the shaft fragment 
but that requires adequate bone below the blade. Poor quality bone responds better, I think, with some sort of non-union type excision or a distal realignment procedure. And for sure, the poor quality bone, the more I've noticed that their alignment can fade over time during that healing um, phase. And, and, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I think residual varus is, like always, not helpful at all. I think that the medial cortex has to ideally be present or be accounted for in some fashion and ideally loaded, no matter the bone quality. And like everything else, sometimes they fail. And I think uh, figuring out those kinds of failures is really important. I think Michael will talk to us more about that. So I'll go through some cases and, and there's always steps in common to all of these things. We'll go through that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I realign them. And I just threw up the terms direct and indirect uh, uh, realignment. And those are probably inaccurate, but for me, it's a working definition. A little bit about medial defects and bad bone and what happens with that. And then, of course, some failure. So the steps in common, no matter who shows up, is the pre-op drawing. I still draw a lot of things out. Uh, and I, particularly whenever I'm putting in a blade, I do have some sort of a, a preoperative thought about where things are all going to end up because they're all interrelated. You have to consider broken implant removal. You have to consider bone defect management, how you're going to realign it and how you're going to get some sort of stability. So here's the first one, a 65 year old fellow that falls from a significant height. He has a comminuted pertrochanteric femur fracture. He gets what I think is a pretty darn good operation with a low calcar screw and a nice uh, reduction and a good contemporary implant. And you know, at some point within the year, his implant breaks. And so using our approach, I go ahead and I draw it out and see where I want it to ultimately be and where all these implants and bone defects may be uh, located. And I'll tell you, once you start getting a cephalomedullary nail, particularly the ones that are considered more geriatric type to start toggling around in a proximal femur, you can have some substantial bone loss. And so bone loss replacement strategies are, are pretty good. And I use a bunch of allograft bone plugs, as you can see in this article, and some reamer irrigator aspirator bone in the pertrochanteric area, uh, in the area of the non-union, sometimes simply fill the, the bone defects, but also a, a, a potential for healing. But I don't really rely on the uh, cancellous bone for healing. I kind of rely on it more for restoring bone quality. So here we are, we're going to take out broken implants it's using the same femur. We're going to send a reamer irrigator aspirator down the canal. We're going to backfill the, the head defect with morselized allograft. We're going to look at our preoperative plan, go ahead and put our chisel followed by our angle blade plate at the appropriate trajectory, and then indirectly bring our a plate side plate down to the side of the shaft of the femur. Here's our allograft plugs. Here's our reamer irrigator aspirator bone graft material. We tension the implant, load the non-union site. And fortunately for this one, he goes ahead and unites his non-union. And here's another one. This is the one I did. This is a cephalomedullary nail that I placed. She has an adequate reduction. She has an adequate nail placement. And look what happens to her at three months, just like the article predicted. She's already got risk factors for non-union. But what I also would like to draw your attention to is that her entire femur looks like it's in varus as well. And so when I reduce her proximal femur, there's no way that that medial cortex can become under load. She's broken her proximal uh, implant now at five months. Uh, and I'll draw your attention to her CT scan that shows really in the mid part of her cervical neck and her head, uh, the relationship of the, uh, the distal end of her neck relative to her calcar. Same thing, we're gonna take out her broken uh, nail here. I'm using a corkscrew device to catch the, uh, cut a thread into the inside. We're gonna pull out her nail. We're gonna do our angle blade plate, do an indirect reduction. Uh, of her non-union and tension our plate, load our non-union, and she goes ahead and unites as well. And that's all great, but sometimes they don't go so great. And I think one of the key points is this realignment, and I'll just call it direct versus indirect. And the reason I like this indirect area is because the tissue that forms in and around a fracture, you know, I've read is, is uh, considered a specific functional entity, and someone's termed it the bone healing unit, right? That's the non-union. It's the bone healing unit, and it responds mechanical forces like Wolf's Law and parent strain theory and Frost concept of mechanostat, which is just a, a remodeling kind of theory, which is pretty interesting. And the bone healing unit fails usually because of mechanical problems, but it can be biological, but almost always a poor mechanical environment, environment is in play. And so interestingly, there's some science to back up that the majority of non-unions will heal if simply given the correct mechanical, mechanical environment. And I, I think that that's really interesting to me uh, because I really like this indirect way of doing things. So in the, the application of it is I tend to leave a lot of non-unions 
the low, not just in the proximal femur, but all over the place. And I try to restore that alignment through the non-union without doing a lot of debreeding, right? Like leave that bone healing unit intact. The other thing is it's conceptually simple because I'm working through the center of rotation of angulation or the so-called cora. So reestablishing alignment through the zone where it's actually crooked is kind of and conceptually simple and I like that and then I can compress the heck out of it and typically that bone healing unit stuff is the precursor to ossifying and becoming bone and I think this indirect manipulation is really good for angulatory and axial and some degrees of rotational deformity it's not good if you have significant translational deformity those kind of people I typically have to take down that all that bone healing unit it also has to have good quality bone to manipulate through. You can't be crushing bone trying to force something. If the bone is weaker than the non-union entity, then that doesn't work. And so how do you deal with that? Well, either you make the bone better, and there are some strategies to kind of improve that, or you excise that bone healing unit, you excise the non-union, and therefore the ability to manip manipulate it is much, much easier. You can do a distal realignment, but I think in the proximal femur, there's two reasons that I um, a little bit uh, apprehensive of that. One is that it's conceptually difficult for me to kind of induce a deformity somewhere else to improve a deformity at a distance. And I always think that there's arthroplasty implications for all these people. And so doing something that really distorts the proximal femur, either for a femoral neck, you know, valgus osteotomy for non-union or some sort of shaft realignment is kind of challenging for the arthroplasty world. So uh, let's give an example of a, a realignment. Here's another patient. She shows up with a broken nail uh, here, but her neck shaft angle is almost 90 degrees. And so you can tell that she was probably nailed in a significant amount of varus. And I've drawn a bunch of lines here and we'll go through them to kind of figure out how do you start with all this stuff? Well, I'll tell you if this is the anatomic axis of the distal fragment, that's the anatomic axis of the proximal fragment. And the angle subtended by that right at the non-union turns out to be this degree of wedge right there. And then that's where my 95 degree angle blade plate goes. I'm going to go through this now. So if we take that wedge of bone out and we go ahead and tilt our proximal femur, we can already start to see how things are going to align. And then our anatomic axis in the proximal distal fragments works out pretty good. So then all we have to do is execute that in the operating room. We've taken out her implant. We go ahead and do our osteotomy. We've excised that bone healing unit because I don't think that I can work through it quite as well with a, with crushing a lot of bone indirectly. And we go ahead and execute that. We put it up to where our, our preoperative plan looks like it turned out pretty good. And then she goes ahead and unites with, with good union in a timely fashion. Here's a second one. This is an 83-year-old woman that has a really interesting history that makes me wonder about a lot of these people that have this chronic problem after they have a cephalomedullary nail. And I think some of these people have either tenuous unions or fibrous unions that they're loading their rod. And at some point, something's going to snap. But she has this history, which makes me very suspicious that she had some problems early on. And sure enough, after she breaks her rod, we go ahead and draw her out. And, and if I just reduce her fracture on a piece of paper and look at it compared to her control side that we flipped over here for, for our purposes for examination or comparison, we can see that she's still in a substantial amount of varus. And so if I want to correct that to improve this whole proximal femoral alignment, I still have to take out some sort of wedge that I can see here. And it looks like her whole femur has had some extensive varus uh, malunion in the proximal third of it. She's broken through probably a stress zone that's developed over the years. But if I take out a 20 degree wedge and modify the 95 degree angle blade plate a little bit to a higher angle that I can go ahead and, uh, and get her a much better mechanical environment for her fracture to heal and much better mechanical environment for her hip to function. Common steps, take out the broken implants, this one I couldn't get out, so I had to use the stack guide rod technique. And so we're able to pull her nail out by stacking the guide rods. We clamp her fracture. Here you can see the varus malalignment and almost the chronicity of her non-union. We go ahead and excise it, put in our dowel up top because she's got a big hole missing in the side of her femur. Close this, compress it, and give her a really good mechanical environment for her to progress on towards union. You know, medial defects are really bad, and I think bad bone combined to give us this thing, I think, is a little bit of the fade, and you hope it ends at the fade instead of the fracture, but sometimes medial defects are really bad. Sometimes you don't see them coming at all, uh, and that only comes apparent after your realignment, and so if the compression on the medial side starts to fail, if it starts to, to bend, that we lose the tension in the plate, and then the, the plate starts to become uh, under stress and uh, gives us reason to have a potential for implant failure, right? 
And so it's pretty easy to see how the stress in the blade plate in something like this with a huge medial defect is going to have a lot of bending forces on it. And this is not a durable plate that you see in this particular example. But let's look at one that's, I think, a little bit more sinister. Here's a guy, he's 80 year old, he was uh, drag racing in Eastern Washington, he got really banged up. Uh, and, uh, and he gets a perfect reduction that you can see here. He's got perfect implant placement. But at a year, you know, he goes ahead and breaks his proximal portion of his rod. And, and, uh, and you can see it here. And so to me, if I look at that EP plane x-ray, it looks like all the other ones, but a CT scan shows, I think in retrospect now, a medial defect of significance. Now just draw your attention to the one that we saw a patient to earlier on, her CT scan through that mid cervical area. She didn't have that though. She had a very similar plane x-ray. She has a very different looking CT in that region. So we do our common steps. We take out the implant, we go ahead and do a little bone graft, put in the allograft plugs. We do our indirect, direct, indirect reduction with our blade. We go ahead and tension the thing and everything looks pretty fine. We've even got screws across the main non-union plane. But over time, I would suggest you he goes ahead and heals, but he is no longer nearly as propped up as I had originally left him. And his plate has to have bent. And it's bent through this proximal area across from the lesser trochanter. And I think in retrospect, I can say that that is his defect. And while he goes ahead and heals, he's also healed in a slightly bent position. And that's a concern to me. And if he continues to bend through that area, a plate is far weaker and biomechanically uh, at a disadvantage compared to a medullary implant. And so this plate can ultimately go ahead and break. I think bone underneath the blade is really important, certainly in the acute setting, because as you bring that side plate down to the shaft of the femur and you crush the undersurface of the bone, your correction then doesn't occur and you still remain in residual varus. So offsetting some of that is important. I think in really bad people, bad bone people, that's where I excise that non-union area. Or you can do other things to kind of bolster it. Because I think if we agree that stability and alignment are important to the success of this, you have to do something to offset that. Here's an, a lady, uh, that I was really concerned about. She, she's got a bisphosphonate associated fracture. I'm worried that her bone quality is really quite poor. Uh, she's got a huge hole in the area where I'm going to do that, that realignment, right? The force underneath the blade is probably about three centimeters total of vacant bone uh, in that particular area. And so for her, I decided to try to use a medullary fibula basically as a little bit of a prop underneath her blade plate so that when I brought her blade plate down, it didn't start to kind of cavitate through the shoulder where the blade sits. Uh, and it works as a, worked as a really good uh, uh, tool to kind of help offset some of the stresses on the blade. And somebody that thought had really, really poor bone quality it was just going to crush through allograft plugs or dial, dowels. And yeah, sometimes they fail. Uh, that's for sure. Like everything else. Here's this first guy that you've already been acquainted with. He was not a healthy person, but he sure had a fracture that I thought I had. Uh, and so he, uh, at eight months, breaks his plate. I still don't really understand why mechanically he broke his plate. I tried to use the fibula uh, trick here. I just put on a long four or five screw and just could place it where I wanted. We reached tensioned a new blade and uh, and put it in, got him good alignment. Uh, and he got about eight months out of it before he passed away. But uh, I hope to, that those last eight months were uh, were okay. Maybe this fellow should have just gotten a nail and then he could have pounded away on it and had a little bit more security. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to entertain that thought for sure. And here's another one that I think kind of alludes to the idea of the chronicity of it. This is a 61-year-old female. Uh, she was in a real good wreck. You can see she's got a segmental femur and the top part is a pertrochanteric femur fracture, 61 years old, she gets a cephalomedullary device. And five years later, she shows up now with her implant broken, doing fine and then boom, without any causative factor, she breaks her proximal uh, implant through what I think has to have been a longstanding tenuous union. Uh, and so I thought everything was fine. We went ahead and put a blade on. I tried to reconstruct some of that trochanteric bone to give her a bigger bone mass to heal into. Uh, and I'll tell you, she didn't last five years on this one. Seven months later, she broke this one. So I'm thinking this all needs to be propped up, improve her mechanics. So I do a closing wedge osteotomy on her, almost like a femoral neck intertroch osteotomy with, a, with an osteotomy blade. Uh, and she goes ahead and 15 months later breaks that one too. And I want to thank Dr. Lack for helping me out with her. Uh, and that was the best operation she had. So, uh, so sometimes uh, they don't all go great. So in summary, you know, I still draw a lot of things out. Uh, uh, people chuckle at me sometimes when I get my scissors out, my crayons, but, uh, but it helps me to understand where things are going. I think uh, what I've really learned over this stuff 
because getting implants out is really hard and you, you have to be patient and you have to be prepared to do something when they don't come out. So you have to have all the tools available to you. Uh, bone defect management, here's just some femoral head allograft plugs. This has been pretty good for restoring some bone graft type material that's solid up into the trochanteric region or reamer irrigator aspirator bone to get things to heal. Some strut allografts have been kind of useful uh, all over, be it distal femur, or proximal femur, and they've been uh, helpful for for me. I tend to really try to do indirect realignment strategies. And uh, when I'm worried about the quality of the bone that I can manipulate through or the look of the non-union material, more established ones, I think excision is pretty good. And you're working through the cora, so the correction is simpler. And dyslosteotomies are, are good because they disturb the non-union a lot less and may accept a bit of a greater load. But to me, they're conceptually and technically challenging. So, you know, the angle blade plate I really like mostly because it allows me to do definitive realignments. I'm not doing, you know, temporary or, or, or provisional realignments to allow something else to occur. I do that with the blade plate. I can then use that same implant to, ten to under tension and load the non-union, and I can use it to put fixation across the non-union if possible. So I think these are really hard problems. Uh, I think alignment and stability are your friends, and of course, various and medial type defects are not. And so like this patient over here on the right side, you know, trust that bone healing unit. Uh, it has everything available to it to heal. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so I like to make it stable and that material seems to like stability and go ahead and ossify and turn to bone. But everything has pros and cons and a failure rate. And this is just one way that I try to have, uh, try to get through managing these particular injury problems. And usually when I failed, it's a problem of executing one of the principles. So thank you very much. I think I'll turn it over to Michael now. Thank you, Avery, for inviting me. And thank you so much, Dr. Bure, for joining uh, the discussion here. Uh, I am uh, really, really interested in, I love looking at these cases, talking about these cases. And um, ultimately, it's driven me to kind of look more critically at these cases and try to understand the risk for failure after treating non-unions and um, whether or not we can identify any specific risk factors and uh, try to understand the fate of these after we've treated them. So I'm going to present our research on that and then finish up this talk. Um, on, you know, Dr. Bray just showed us how complex these are, complex patients, complex surgical problems. So if we can avoid a pertrochanteric non-union in the first place, uh, <clears throat> it's much better for the patient and for the surgeon. So we'll talk a little bit about some surgical strategies to avoid generating a non-union. So as Avery pointed out, intertrochanteric and pertrochanteric femur, femur fractures are, are very, very common injuries. They're uh, one of the most common injuries being treated. Uh, the rate of non-union is low. Uh, it's ultimately unknown what it is, but it's, it's low. And so as such, and as Dr. Bray alluded to, there's been very little written on the outcomes after non-union repair. There's, there's plenty that's written to demonstrate to us risk factors for development of non-union, but not so much on outcomes after treatment of the non-union, which leads a lot of questions. And as Dr. Bray again sort of pointed out, these have very different personalities. The question is which are better treated with blades, which are better treated with nails, which should be treated uh, at their index with an arthroplasty. What are the complications? And again, can we identify risk factors for reoperation? So. Uh, as I've seen my partner's cases and my own cases, I really wanted to get a critical look at um, whether or not we're being successful with a single operation. What are the nuances of that operation? How commonly are these failing? And again, what are some of the pitfalls that we can recognize when the non-union presents to our clinic so that we can avoid a failure? So we did a retrospective review of... Um, all patients who are treated with a non-union repair of the femur, initially sort of screening all of these patients so that we could capture the pertrochanteric non-unions. Ultimately, we included um, uh, basically every intertrochanteric with subtrochanteric extension uh, a fracture that was treated acutely and then presented with a non-union. And that non-union is treated surgically and the primary outcome was treatment failure. We define treatment failure by conversion to arthroplasty uh, or a persistent non-union uh, one year after a non-union repair. Secondary outcomes were return to the operating room for other reasons, 
revision, non-union repair, infection, implant removal, and minor complications. So over the time period, we treated 87 non-unions, 73 of them had adequate follow-up. And if you look at the AOOTA classification that Avery mentioned earlier, predominantly the non-unions were three and four part intertrochanteric femur fractures, so the unstable patterns and those with uh, subtrochanteric extension. Uh, and as Dr. Brake pointed out, these fractures are usually very well vascularized. That's consistent. Uh, we had 90% oligotrophic with a smattering of hypertrophic and very few atrophic non-unions. Uh, the mean age was 58 years old with a wide range and a bimodal distribution. As you'd expect, the younger patients have higher energy mechanisms, the elderly patients with a lower energy mechanism. 12% were septic non-unions and 12% were atypical femur fractures that were treated surgically and then went on to non-union. So the results for all comers, um, we had a treatment failure of 13%. And again, these are is a relatively small cohort, um, but uh, I think still, still meaningful. Um, when we look at the, the patients who ended up with a treatment failure, Again, they were either treated to treated with a conversion arthroplasty or um, uh, had a persistent non-union a year after uh, their non-union treatment. And uh, there was a few patients who developed avascular necrosis that was severe enough to go on to be converted to an arthroplasty as well. There's almost a 30% return to the operating room and a fairly substantial return to the operating room for revision of a non-union repair. Uh, there was deep infection in eight patients, superficial infection in a few, and uh, implant removal in four patients. So we wanted to look at uh, treatment of the non-union with specific implant types. Um, as you can see, blade plates were used more frequently. Not surprisingly, these um, are, as Dr. Beret pointed out, used for deformity correction and non-union compression. Um, there's not, if the, again, the numbers are fairly low, but if you look at the difference between blade plate and, and nails returned to the OR and treatment failure, there's really not a substantial difference with uh, failure being a persistent non-union and AVN in both groups. The devil there is in the details though, we talk about the personality of these different non-unions, whether they're stiff, they're flexible, whether or not there's bone loss. The implant choice is oftentimes driven by that. So I don't think that it's really fair to be comparing the blade plate to the nail uh, for that reason. So I really wanted to look at independent risk factors for, for failure. And after looking at all of the variables, as Dr. Bray, Bray mentioned, the medial bone loss seems to be the one that stands above all else. Out of the 73 uh, non-unions treated, 16 of them had substantial medial bone loss. And out of those, 43% ended up reoperated for revision non-union and four of them ultimately failed. So I think medial bone loss, the inability to, to load and maintain load across the medial cortex is a significant risk factor for failure. So in concluding that research, and there's a lot more to come out of it in regards to the nuances, but I think it's important to understand that when we look at this cohort, deformity, bone loss, bone quality, all of these variables related to the personality of the non-union will drive the implant decision, whether or not that's a blade plate versus a nail. But even in the context of that, medial bone loss seems to be an independent risk for reoperation and potential treatment failure. In this cohort, we did have uh, a small group of patients who went on to develop avascular necrosis, which was a little bit of a surprise to me. Um, but each one of those patients had an aggressive non-union takedown in multiple operations. And so I think one learning point for, for mitigating the risk of AVN in these patients is, especially in the setting of a non-union, uh, consider osteotomy, as Dr. Bure has talked about, rather than an aggressive non-union takedown to prevent damage to the blood supply to the femoral head. So I'm going to close this talk with uh, some strategies for acute fracture treatment uh, to hopefully avoid a non-union. As this cohort showed us, most of the non-unions that have occurred in unstable intertrochanteric and pertrochanteric patterns, almost all of them are well vascularized. So as has been stated over and over again, these non-unions are predominantly a result of mechanical failure, 
which is either a poor reduction or insufficient stability or a combination of both. So the, the guiding principles are, are quite simple. It's the execution that matters. One is obtaining and maintaining a high quality reduction. And the other is choosing a stable implant. In order to uh, obtain and maintain a reduction, you have to understand the nuances of the fracture pattern. Recognize that even if you have a great reduction, the entry site will overpower whatever you've done for the reduction. So you have to be very critical of that. As has been mentioned before, the proximal femur cannot tolerate varus, so you should not leave the operating room with such. Uh, but it's very important to recognize that the sagittal plane reduction is equally important. We talk about this concept of intrinsic stability, where the main fracture fragments loading on each other will help protect the implant and will promote union. So we, we're really gonna focus on high quality reduction in, in both planes for some intrinsic stability and fracture loading. The reduction algorithm is pretty simple as such, uh, you know, ideally we're attempting a closed uh, indirect manipulative reduction. And if that doesn't work, you escalate your techniques in a biologically friendly way in order to ultimately achieve a reduction that is gonna be acceptable and promote stable union. But uh, understanding the pattern and the potential pitfalls are going to help inform your reduction strategy as well as your implant selection. On the left-hand side of the screen is a very high energy, relatively simple appearing intertrochanteric femur fracture in a 20-year-old after a motor vehicle collision. The middle is a comminuted pertroch with subtrochanteric extension in a 50-year-old who was hit by a car on a scooter. And on the right is your reverse obliquity four-part intertrochanteric femur fracture after a ground level fall. So each of these is going to require a different reduction strategy and potentially a different implant in order to obtain and maintain a high quality reduction, promote union, and hopefully avoid a, a, a development of a non-union. Most of these fractures now are being treated with a trochanteric entry nail. And the, the sort of the dogma in regards to the entry portal for a trochanteric nail has been the entry site is on the tip of the trochanter on the AP. But what we've learned over time with this, these nails is that each nail design is a little bit different. And there's variance in each one of our proximal femurs in regards to the morphology. So if you're using the tip of the trochanter as your entry portal, you have a recipe for a malreduction. And again, no matter how high quality your reduction is, if your starting point is off, it's going to introduce an iatrogenic malreduction. So the solutions to this for trochanteric nailing are relatively straightforward. One is you can template the start site, and the other is to medialize your starting point to avoid that, to avoid varus deformation. Here's an example. So this is an intact proximal femur, but imagine a, an unstable fracture pattern proximally with a starting site on the tip of the trochanter. And then with the chosen nail, you can lay a template over the top of that and see that the entry portal for this patient's particular proximal femoral morphology is significantly medial to the tip of the trochanter. And so using the, the tip is likely to introduce a varus deformity. And of course, the other important part of this is your, your starting point will never be more medial than where your wire is first placed. The bone on the lateral side is much softer when you get to the medial aspect of the greater the trochanter and the femoral neck. Uh, you have a lot. Uh, you have hard bone, and you've got to expect uh, the reamer to migrate laterally. So, very important to template these out or medialize your start point. This is a clinical example of what happens. So, this is a reasonably good reduction obtained percutaneously with a start site on the tip of the trochanter for a trochanteric entry nail. And as the nail goes in, there's significant varus deformation. So we talked a lot about the solutions to manage a, uh, a, a over lateralized starting portal. Uh, medializing the portal with the reamer itself is very difficult again, because that bone is on the medial or on the lateral neck is, is very dense. Uh, that we've described putting plates to, to medialize the starting point. We've described uh, putting fi fibula allograft struts, but those are challenging and sometimes not effective. One really nice effective maneuver, if the fracture pattern allows it, is placing a blocking drill bit or a blocking bolt to avoid uh, the, the uh, trajectory that you see above creating a varus deformity and just really redirecting the nail into the medullary canal.
in maintaining the, the reduction. So if you've gone through the paces to obtain a high quality reduction, have a proper uh, entry portal, it's gonna be important to, to choose a stable implant. Again, the, the non-unions develop in the most unstable of the patterns. And oftentimes it's because they're uh, not adequately stabilized. Uh, Avery mentioned to us that the sliding hip screw device is not appropriate for these unstable patterns. And I think increasingly literature is, is teaching us and our experience too is teaching us that, that uh, implant with rotational stability of the proximal segment is much better than one without. So I would strongly consider in these unstable patterns nail design with rotational stability. There's lower rates of reoperation, less varus collapse, less implant cutout, less nail fracture, and better functional outcomes. The last part about, or the last point in regards to avoiding generating a non-union is the medical and social optimization. Uh, there's definitely a role for a hip fracture service. This is a, a very important part of the care of these patients. So we circle back to those three cases. Uh, each one of them has a very different personality. The first fracture is treated with an open reduction. These high energy pertroke fractures in young patients can be very uh, deceptive and difficult to reduce. So I jumped straight to an open reduction on that patient and you can see the blocking bolt was effective. The middle patient was treated completely with indirect means to maintain that fracture hematoma. And a, again, a nail with rotational control for that unstable proximal segment is used. And then the last patient is uh, treated with a, a single medullary screw nail design uh, and an unstable pattern and perhaps a little bit of a varus malreduction. So if I have a worry about any of these three, I worry mostly about the low energy unstable pattern in the elderly patient. And as you can see, uh, that is the one that had problems. We see collapse, uh, screw cut out, ultimately a non-union and then converted to a total hip arthroplasty. So I think hopefully this reinforces the concept that both reduction and stability conferred for, by your implant are very important. So in conclusion, reoperation after non-unions in our cohort was surprisingly high, uh, almost a 30% return to the operating room, but the treatment failure was relatively rare. Uh, many of the non-unions were treated with revision, uh, non-union repair, and went on to heal successfully. Medial bone loss is a harbinger for potential failure, um, potential reoperation. So we're going to continue to look critically at those cases and try to find uh, strategies to mitigate that. And lastly, uh, to avoid a non-union, focus primarily on a marriage of high quality reduction and a stable implant. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those uh, excellent, excellent talks, talks uh, great, great overview. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing all those um, cases. cases. I think uh, there, there were so many points, learning, learning points, points and technical, technical tips, tips and tricks. We have a couple of questions in the chat, chat and I know that not everybody can read them. them. So maybe I think Dr. Dr. Henley, you put a couple of questions in. I think Dr. Bray, maybe you answered some, but I think that might be useful for the group. Brad, uh, did you thanks, want to? Lisa. Thank, Thank you. Um, I, uh, I posed a question to Dave, which he did answer in the chat because he showed that he used 95 degree blades, but also there were uh, higher angle blades, especially when he was resecting wedges, but they weren't necessarily the osteotomy uh, blades. And I asked him to share the rationale for selecting the appropriate blade angle. Um, and he answered it, but I'll let him answer it verbally. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, you know, the osteotomy blades are those blades that come above 95 degrees, like the 110, 120, 130s, those kinds of blades. They, they come in a very limited length. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're, they're four-hole implants. And so uh, they have the right angle sometimes, but they don't have the right length. And so um, that can be a little bit of a uh, conundrum. And so, um, so simply taking the 95-degree blades and bending them to the appropriate angle and you they all come on the same set and you can you can bend one to 120 degrees and just kind of line it up with the other one the the true 120 in there you've got 120 degree blade that comes in the appropriate length and so um you know you, you probably don't remember this but but you taught me some of that principle way back when and it was all about what happens when the chisel goes in the wrong spot you know just because the the implant comes at 95 degrees doesn't mean you have to uh 
live with it at 95 degrees. You can bend your implant to match a subtle, you know, off track chisel pathway. And so, uh, so that's all I, I did. I took what you taught me when I was a fellow and kind of applied it in a bit of a different way. But it, but your point, the point, important point is that I knew I was going to have to do that because I drew it out, you know? Yeah, no, it's a really good hint. And people should be aware that although these blades appear to be really stiff, they are somewhat elastic. You can also increase their angles by, I'll call it over tensioning in them, but a tensioning in them a lot. And as you watch your image interop as you tension them, you can see things that have a stable medial buttress go from your, well, let's say 95 up to 100 or 105 degrees as you uh, tension the plate. So there is some elasticity to them, but it's great. Um, the other thing to know is that those osteotomy plates have different, I'll call them um, offsets between the blade and the, the shaft and they're five, 10 or 15 millimeters. And you don't necessarily want that in these, these uh, conditions. So excellent. And then I did put another hint in um, to those people who are using um, sliding hip screws still, uh, but find that after they create their opening for their intermedullary screw into the head that they may have a lateral wall at risk. Uh, they, the comp one company does make a trochanteric side plate, which you can then place over the uh, implant, over the lateral hip, the sliding hip screw, and that will buttress your lateral wall. And it's a really good trick to have. And um, that's, uh, another just thing in your armamentarium, but thanks, Dave. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, Any other questions, questions or comments? Or comments? I, I just one. Oh, go, go, please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Yes. yes. Short question and which perhaps is not relevant, you know, I've not kept up with literature for 10, 15 years. So electrical stimulation is totally not at all used for non-unions? No, electrical stimulation. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, external stimulation devices, the, the ultrasound stimulators and the electrical stimulators. I think that the literature is borne out over time that the electrical stimulation devices really are uh, do not help. Uh, and I think that um, there's some evidence that suggests that the ultrasound ones uh, may be helpful. Uh, a lot of that data um, is, um, I don't want to say industry driven, but uh, but has a potential to have some subtle biases with that. Uh, but but I think that the, regardless, the evidence for the ultrasound ones is is there is some nothing for the electrical. Hmm. Okay, because very old literature suggest, used to suggest that they were quite useful, but yeah, no, that was no. about. 50 years yeah. ago, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave and Mike and Avery. This was a great talk. Um, this is Ken Chin here. Um, you know, drawing it out makes total sense. And I was wondering if you uh, you guys ever used uh, the advent of 3D printing and planning some of these osteotomies. You know, I, um, I, I still like uh, uh, paper and pens. Uh, I... I to start with, I, I use uh, some 3D printing now. Aaron has been really kind to help me with a couple of um, 3D uh, printouts. Uh, I have one actually coming up very soon, uh, one he did a week or two ago for us uh, of a, a tibia. So I usually use them for, for tibias. Um, I think it's a great uh, adjunct um, uh, to help see some things that maybe you didn't see. Uh, and so, uh, so I use that, but um, but not very much, but I have found them useful. Thank, Thank you. One, one final, final question, question from, from Dr. Dr. Lack. I was just going to comment, uh, Dr. Bray's made a really good point about drawing it out. And I, I would just um, second that and that there are some digital ways to cut out the fracture fragments. So there's a bone setter and other techniques, but the, when you actually draw um, kind of sit down and draw out the fragments. It's not just that case you're helping yourself with. I feel like you're, you know, you're helping yourself understand what you're seeing on the images because it's that act of drawing it out and then forcing you to think about each fragment and then seeing it in the OR and then seeing what your result is. That's part of a process that helps you in the future. I don't know if Dr. Bray feels the same way. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, I, I, I get a lot. I can tell that the, the times that I haven't drawn something out, I, I've, I've underestimated the complexity of it. 
And it's very unusual that if I sit there and I just draw it out and I, I kind of find it fun. It's like arts and crafts, right? Uh, I find it fun, but uh, I'm rarely disappointed with what the final product looks like. And, and I've been able to see all the little pitfalls, little traps and little things like that. And it, it almost is like a, a dry run, uh, if I can say it like that. But it, it, uh, it, really, it really helps me personally a lot. And I haven't, I haven't had much experience with the digital stuff. You know, I know there's a variety of ones out, that are out there. I, 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 the, I remember way back uh, several years ago, we had one at Harborview that was kind of cumbersome and bulky and it was kind of crappy. Uh, and so it was like, it, it, it was useful. I'm sure there's tons now that are way better, but I still like just drawing it out in the pack. The packs is good because I can put all the lines and the angles and I know what they are. And then I just, I just put the paper over top of it and draw them all out and then I just get out my scissors and then off I go. So I, I, I but I agree with you. I get a lot of, um, help out of it you know for yeah, me, just, I, I find yeah. that um you know don rumsfeld talked about the knowns the unknowns and then the unknown unknowns and i think by drawing this stuff out it helps reveal to me some of the unknown unknowns so there's at least you know hopefully i have enough bandwidth in the or to contend with then the remaining unknown unknowns uh so being as prepared as possible and doing that deliberate practice that will's talking about is uh, really, and Dave, of course, uh, super important. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you for some excellent, excellent talks. talks and and um, everyone, everyone have, have a great day. day. Thank, Thank you. you.